So today I want to bring you a tour of one of the most unique fish rooms that I've ever seen, either on YouTube or in person. Elizabeth and John were gracious enough to host our local fish club's board of directors meeting and then gave us a tour afterwards. I honestly have to say, from the octopus to the Soda Lake cichlids and everything in between, this has to be one of the most unique fish rooms that I've ever seen. So let's jump in and get started. All right, so we're here at this octopus tank. Uh, this is a reef tank. Um, so Elizabeth, how long have you had this tank? I know you, you were talking earlier and you've had this for quite a long time. Uh, this tank has been set up for uh, 22 years now. It's running continuously and there's been an octopus, it's been an um, octopus tank for 13 years. So I know octopus are definitely unique. So just curious, what does it take to keep an octopus? Uh, so first of all, um, it takes some basic knowledge of water chemistry. You want to really be able to uh, have a stable water chemistry more than anything. Um, you want so you really need to have the basics of that down. You want to have a mature tank, not a cycle tank. Not a I just got done cycling this tank. When I say mature tank, a, a year is really best. Um, even though octopuses can grow to be very large, believe it or not, they spend a lot of time hunting copepods, amphipods. Um, the more life that is in your live rocks, the more little things they have to chase around and hunt, the happier they are going to be. Um, a lot of live rock, they really enjoy hiding in the live rock, plus the mimicking all of the textures and the colors. Um, I frequently get asked about toys. Uh, toys are something you're interested in as it, when they're, you know, novel for a second. Um, but they don't, they don't play with toys. They don't take apart Legos and put them together. Um, they really spend a lot more time looking like rock, looking like coral. Uh, frequently nocturnal, which means obviously they, they are not out all day long. So if you're not a person who wants to have an animal that hides a large portion of the day, an octopus might not be for you. The one thing that I've come to learn about octopus is that they're escape artists. So what can you do to prevent that? Ah, well, so in 13 years, I'm lucky I've never had an escape, but as you can see, uh, there's duct tape along the entire surface here. I actually weighted this down. Um, so we have this piece of plexiglass that we cut to fit the back perfectly. And then if there are any tiny little gaps, we actually use um, earplug wax, believe it or not, um, and then duct tape over all of it. Uh, but believe it or not, um, earplug wax and duct tape keeps everything in. It'll keep in broke fish, glyptorous, eels, um, you just have to do the tape job. So we were talking a little bit earlier about an organization called Tonmo, which can help you learn more about how to take care of octopus and other cephalopods. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So Tonmo uh, stands for the Octopus News Magazine Online. Um, and as a catch-all, it's all things cephalopod. But it's especially a... a website which is dedicated to people who want to keep cephalopods as pets. So that's octopuses and cuttlefish. So let's go ahead and feed the octopus now, which is something I'm really looking forward to.
All right, so these are some pretty interesting fish too. Uh, this is, looks like it's like a 55 gallon. Yeah, so this is, uh, these fish are called uh, soda cichlids, uh, Lake Natron soda cichlids. These are, they come from a salt lake or a soda lake in uh, Tanzania, yep, um, in Africa. So this is a volcanic lake. So it's being fed water that is uh, between 80 up to 120 degrees. The water chemistry is crazy. It's got uh, pH, the pH can be up to like 10 and a half. Um, it can, the uh, specific gravity can be up to like 1.2 on occasion. I mean, that's almost pure salt water. Yes, and, uh, and then of course the, the craziest thing is that it swings. So this is not gonna be a stable water chemistry. It changes frequently. Um, so in addition to the high heat, uh, the really caustic water chemistry uh, has caused these guys to uh, make, have some adaptation so they can breathe air. They gulp air at the surface, um, which they will do in conditions of low oxygen, but on occasion they'll do it socially uh, too. The females are mouth brooders. Um, they actually have evolved to excrete uh, urea instead of ammonia because uh, pH of where they live is so high, the ammonia just won't actually even leave their body. Um, I have, right now you can see the male is in spawning behavior. Um, He's definitely shimmying around, trying to get these females interested. Now he's built a nest, and his nest um, is in the sand over here. These guys are one of those cichlids that make these perfect circular nests. He will build a nest in the sand, this perfect circle. The, the female will drop her eggs in the groove of the nest. The male fertilizes them, and then she picks them up, and she'll uh, she'll then brood the eggs in her mouth for the rest of the time. I have actually seen males holding uh, eggs and holding babies too. We we keep them um, as complete on uh, herbivores. We do only only like rapeshi super green. We don't keep them as extreme. We keep them at about 90 degrees. We like to keep the pH at around between 8.5 and 9. I like it 8.7-ish. And then what do you do to keep the pH at that level? Um, so we are using um, some reef buffer, some alkaline buffer, some tanganyika buffer. Um, we occasionally, when I'm doing a water change from a salt water tank, I'll actually top down. So the octopus tank is pretty, pretty pristine. Um, and so I might actually, when I'm taking a bucket of water out of the octopus tank, add it in to the cichlid tank. Um, Cause we also want really high uh, TDS. We are using only um, aged tap water when we're doing uh, water changes, because these guys, they just, they want junk in their water. When it comes to uh, aesthetics, they're really not very pretty. Um, boy, the, Lake Natron is not a pretty place. Basically, it has uh, red algae, flamingos, and these guys, and, and that's pretty much it. This is not a tank you look at because it's beautiful, but it's a tank you look at because this is one of the craziest habitats it's just it's, and it's just really really cool to be able to say i'm recreating a volcanic lake in my living room in detroit absolutely i mean it's outstanding for sure so this is definitely one of the tanks that drew my attention because i like rare fish and i like unique aquascapes and unique fish and unique situations so this is definitely really cool i was super lucky to have walked into these fish um watercolors fish store in grand rapids michigan um they were showing us their awesome basement laboratory uh they had these guys uh they they're not a thing that most people know about um i started to cry uh i rolled up my sleeve and showed them that my tattoos on my arm and at that point the deal was done it was nice. struck it was yeah because um, they were really kind of protective of them too 
they didn't want to see these going to just anybody. To anyone who just, you know, random fish person, right? Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you start throwing uh, cichlid pellets at these guys, they're done. This tank actually started out, it started out as a planted freshwater tank. Um, and we, uh, I don't even remember what was in it at first. So we decided we wanted to put the bumblebee gobies in there. They're just really cool. The only thing in this tank are bumblebee gobies and a mono shrimp. Um, the plants, uh, so I started just very slowly adding salt. You know, it's not a very high brackish, uh, super low end, um, but we just went slow. The plants melted off at first, but uh, you know, all the roots stayed in. So this is um, actually uh, um, the sea chem fluorite. Uh, okay. And then we capped it with sand. Gotcha. Because uh, then we couldn't see anything. So, and so some of the fluoride has sort of evolved up above the sand now, but. Um, so that was just a kind of a nice mixture. Um, boy, this Java moss has really taken off. Yeah, I mean, so it's kind of it's kind of cool that you can you know people always will ask about plants in uh, salt in brackish tanks and salt water, and see here you can do it. Yeah, it just took some time and some patience. Let's uh, go back to see another salt tank. The lighting is down a little bit, so some of our corals have gone back in at this point. But you can see over here, I've got a jawfish, and then. In this tank, one of the fun things about this tank is it's a complete recreation of the Florida Keys. Everything in here from the live rock to the fish to the, uh, the corals, everything in this tank was collected in the Florida Keys in basically the same location. All of the, sh uh, the, the snails, the hermit crabs, uh, everything in this tank is a Florida Keys tank, except the, the dachshund. This tank also has a pistol shrimp. There he goes. Yeah. That's all. So we'll have him. Some maroon clowns. And, um, this is, we're starting to get some eggs now, pretty That's regularly. It. Nice. However, um, I have yet to move forward. Like I need to, you know, if I want to actually try to breed some. Yeah. Have you done that? I have done that. Okay. Well, you're going to be what happens after next. Okay. Um, it's been a while. Yeah. Well. But you can see the eggs here. Yes. And then. If you, oh, it's bang. one of their favorite anemones, but he's just stood back for the minute. Yeah. And it's just the two of them. And they're anemones. And. A little bit of live know, rock. and. There's some live rock. There's some pretty um, porcelain crabs in here, too. A lot of freshwater people who keep have interest in salt water like these guys oh the, the pulsing zinnias so we definitely keep our pulsing zinnias in our um in our nano tanks because <laughs> <laughs> you get one you've got a bunch um and in this tank there's a mantis shrimp so we'll see if we can uh actually the shrimp got fed yesterday so i don't know if we'll get it to come out oh here she comes so one of the really awesome things Oh, there she is. She's just beautiful. Um, when you keep these guys, they frequently rearrange. They'll rearrange the, the tank, too. And so really what we've done is put uh, put the mantis shrimp in here with the uh, zinnia so that if it carries the zinnia off into a hiding spot, it no one like, cares. Care. <laughs> yeah, it's going to we're going to have. There we go. That was just the mantis shrimp doing what the mantis shrimp does. Yeah, so we've got, uh, looks like now we've got uh, a Rift Lake cichlid tank. So when John was in college, uh, he got to go to Africa. Um, he, got to, he got to go to this lake. So actually, I think we were just reading a Smithsonian article about the incredible uh, evolutionary adaptations it takes to be a Rift Lake cichlid. And John was like, I went there. I want those fish in my basement. That had to have been an amazing trip. You know, your, your Rift Lake Cichlid tank, uh, absolutely stunning. Uh, great tank. You got a few oddballs, uh, some Kenya, it looks like. Um, maybe. Uh, 
yeah, so I got some of the some of the Julia de Coromis and some uh, Aratus, but everything seems to be getting along pretty well. So definitely good stuff. Yeah, you know it's funny because people always told me they're all they're so aggressive, um, but then I realized when you grow up, really when you start with damsels, saltwater damsels. Oh no, they're not. And really, these are these are basically damsels that just got separated when the rift happened and became freshwater. Yeah, I mean, I have this opinion that African cichlids and saltwater fish are literally the same thing when it comes to temperament. Yeah, and you know, I personally, if I was going to do a, a fish only with, with live rock tank, I would do this instead, which is why we did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It literally is the same thing. But they're kind of more fun, I, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, they're more fun, and then you can keep more of them, and you can pack them in there and, you know, do a few simple things to curb aggression, and you're in pretty good shape. Yeah. So this is Lemmy, this South American lungfish. Um, and he's really cool just because of all the evolutionary uh, adaptations that these guys have. They're, he's a tetrapod. When they first discovered these things, they didn't even know how to classify them if they were a fish or a reptile or what. Because he, he has paired lungs. Um, he actually must surface to breathe or he'll drown, um, but they can actually live outside of water. Um, if they are uh, in, it gets to be the dry season, they just make a cool mud cocoon around themselves and they can live like that for like up to four years and just this mud cocoon where they, they it's called um estivation they estivate instead of hibernate so if that whole time they can go without food um they don't have fins they don't really have they have these little army arm or leg things it's like little half appendages sort of so they're sort of like um the law, the, the missing link, really, between the water and land. Um, we are, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're pretty closely related. They are using these fish uh, for medical research, um, looking at both heart and lung, different kinds of treatments. Um, and they're just, uh, they're kind of boring. I mean, he just kind of sits around like this. They're not pretty fish, um, but they're just a really cool freak of nature. Just uh, when he eats, he doesn't have teeth. He has grinding plates. So we feed him worms, chunks of uh, shrimp, fish, all kinds of things. Um, and he has to smash them and then spit it out and reposition it into the grinding plates and do some more smashing. Um, and the cool thing is these guys you can actually keep with lots of other fish uh, and they don't eat them frequently because they can't swim after them fast enough to catch them. So I, I in the winter time my goldfish are in this pond um, but I've kept them with a school of tetras. Um, I've kept with like tiny tetras with larger tetras and they're all just fine. Cool, very cool. This is a very cool fish. Um, so next up is this pretty cool brackish tank. These guys are beg as bad as the dogs. So when I come downstairs, one of the hardest, just the hardest things about these guys is like I can never get a video or pictures of them where they're not right in the top corner because that's where I feed them smart smart fish they definitely learn very quickly they know who feeds them they know wh what corner of the tank they get fed in uh, but like i said unfortunately that means as soon as i approach the tank like i can't get them to swim over here and get pictures of them you know nope it's just right up there when i first got these guys uh th this was a covid purchase so we had called the pet store and we were going to get some F8 puffers. Uh, and, and that's get, figure eight, right? Figure eight. 
So we had a tank all set up for figure eights and we got these guys uh, and we got home with them. And after maybe a week or so, we realized we had one figure eight and we had these two green spotted. The figure eight didn't make it, but the green spotted did. And uh, so that meant we had a whole different setup that we were gonna be looking at. So they started out uh, kind of in a low end brackish, along with those sheep's head minnows. The other fish that we have in here are some sheep's head minnows from Florida. And when I first got those, they were uh, straight up fresh. And let's see, the, uh, the puffers, they were, they were in low end brackish. So I started uh, slowly upping the salt. And we had a 30 gallon tank at, at first too, because I just put them in a tank I had already had. Um, so then when I realized what I had, I had to slowly raise the salt and, you know, worry about crashing my cycle and the whole deal. It worked out just fine. I just did it slow. Um, and then the 30 gallon tank I had sprung a leak. So about a month ago, we had to replace it with this tank. We're going through about the second or third ugly phase now. We, we kind of, we went through diatoms. Um, and so now we're, we're starting to get our cyano, um, but uh, we're, we're kind of beating that back and getting control of that. Um, doesn't help having the grow lights over the pond right next to it, um, but you know, the puffer fish don't care. No, well just we do, for sure. Yeah. Just us. Yep. So these guys, I feed them uh, several different varieties of snails from all around the, the house. The funny thing is the fresh or saltwater snails, their, their shells are so strong that they can't get through those, those guys. Um, and there are actually some hermit crabs that have managed to live in here because they, some, they, they uh, hide pretty well. They don't eat the, pe the pencil urchins. You put in the smaller urchins and they, they like, they eat them up in two seconds. Those pencil urchins, they do not seem to recognize as being alive. Uh, mm. And I, I think that's really strange because the pencil urchins seem to move faster when they're moving. Um, you know, and I'm gonna throw it through in that one piece of macroalgae there hoping that something will happen with it, but it, it, it hasn't died, it hasn't thrived, it didn't go sexual, so we'll just see what happens with that. It's kind of like, you know, the the entire uh, the entire zoo here is just it's all an experiment, you know. What a lot of fish keeping is. Yeah, you throw things in glass boxes and then just kind of sit back and cross your fingers and hold your breath and see what you get. For sure, definitely. So. In this tank, we just have just her and um. Like a little twenty-nine gallon uh, bow front here. Yeah. Uh, with like a, the uh, neon um, dotty back. Yeah, kind of the obligatory, um, along with the obligatory green star polyp, which is awesome. And when it started to kind of take off on the ground, to be honest with you, we kind of slowed down. We just started to take a break on this tank because we really would like for that green star polyp to kind of grow out like a, like a lawn. Kind of like a planted tank, basically. Exactly. And then it's like, well, maybe, how many things can you have going on at once? Um, so, yeah, we, we, we definitely need some, some more zoas or some, some more color on the top. Um, but we're kind of like at that, man, when you start to mess with it, we're going to wreck it stage. And there's a little bit of, we're just not quite sure what, where we want to go next. And there's a lot to, to say with letting this, letting something go too, you know, not messing with it. It, it can be really hard, um, but it's better than crashing a system when you're just, just because you were bored with it and you didn't know what you wanted to do. So this is um, one of our polypterists. We have a few different species of polypterists. Um, this is actually a wild caught Delhezi. I've had people argue with me on Facebook about whether it's a Delhezi or not, and I'm just not getting into that. Um, I, this is absolutely wild caught. Um, 
and he we love polypterists because they're air breathers they're just really super cool they they go up every 10 20 minutes to take a quick breath of air um, and then they really kind of spend their time looking like they're dead um, laying around behind him we have lady and she is again she's like She's just hiding down there. Oh. Um, and it, but again, I mean, she'll be down there and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, she goes to the top, she takes a breath and she pops back down. Which, so this is really kind of more of a black water style, not like super traditionally black water in that, um, you know, we didn't have tea stain the, uh, the water because the fish don't particularly need that uh, from the chemistry point of view. But they really like kind of more muddy um, a little more stagnant sort of water. Um, so this is a, a eh, sort of like an African river habitat, but I'm, I'm saying that with, we're taking a lot of liberty saying that. Um, but from an evolutionary standpoint, we're, uh, we're more related to these guys than a lot of other, other things you might find. But polypterists go through awful phases where they'll beat each other up and then all of a sudden they're best friends. Can't keep anything else with them um, but other monster fish. So I'd definitely like to thank Elizabeth and John for opening up their home to us and letting us look at this unique fish room. I really enjoyed it and learned quite a bit. And I hope you did too. So with that being said, stay safe, stay fishy, and I'll catch you on the next video.